uh, this is the blue, the blue thing which you see there is actually the sensor. You have seen more, most of you have seen the sensors. It has, most of you have probably seen from the, the evolution of it, it's a sticker. And I think uh, that's an update which you wanted to talk about. It, is, it will be accessible to all. There'll be no setup and there'll be things which uh, probably we didn't imagine in any sports right now can do. Uh, that's what's supposed to be launched, by the way, in detail, but COVID struck and we have obviously pushed it for a later date. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we all know it's instant, visual, and actionable. These three pillars is what we measure ourselves on. Uh, if we are not doing these three, we better don't exist. And that's the mandate which we have for ourselves. Move on. A muscle memory tool, which gives you visualization uh, without cameras. The whole idea is that you cannot carry camera everywhere. If you see the next slide, what we have done now is things like a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of folks in this group have actually asked, Gavin, can we understand whether they've timed it well? Can you understand whether they you know, hit the sweet spot or not? Can I understand more detailed trends of how the batting is? Can I see analytics about if this lever gets changed, what, what's happening to others? We have built all those things into our next release. You see sweet spot index, you will see percentage of balls middle, what percentage of middle you're talking about, things which is not there in any sport so far right now, right? Uh, which will be there available to every player, all right, and accessible to all. Wagon wheel, uh, graphs around your performance trends and so on and so forth. Just a few snippet to you. Move on, please. What we wanted to actually discuss with you, and probably in every session of ours we will, we'll, we'll share with you one case study from a, a player somewhere in the globe, all right? How they have used feedback to up the ante. And straight back here is a context. What the message is, the data which we get is no longer something which in some R&D, it can be used to up the ante, move the needle. This player, and obviously between match one, match two, match three, there have been multiple practice sessions. His back lift angle, back lift is nothing but the you know, initial back lift where when he's taking a stance, how wide his back is. Widest is by, during the back lift, how wide it goes. And the highest back lift angle is at the highest point of the bat. Right? If you see, this player was playing, is predominantly an offside player. And when in form, he's beautiful to see. Uh, this was during some time in October last year. See his progression. His coach identified a few things with him. What was happening, it was he was not coming behind the ball early enough and he was cutting across his back part coming down the 60 extra milliseconds to be behind the line of the ball making it straighter while playing in the off to so behind the line from 36 to 28 this is the offside play he could really really up the ante uh, and match third which you see which was after a lot of practice sessions he actually played a match winning knock Right, it's an eight degree shift. The, 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 the wrong question probably is, is that from 36 to 28, is that ideal? No, but there are levers for change depending on the batting style of a player, which can result into something which you never thought about. And there was huge level, level of consistency, which that player could feel. Yeah, I wanted to leave this thought with you. The bottom line is data can make a difference. Most of us in this group knows we are now seeing it to believe it that it can make a huge difference. Eight degrees shift can make a huge change in somebody's batting. Yeah. Uh, one please. Uh, you know, Chris, here's the call. Uh, you know, he, he has been a person who's really, really pushed us hard. I must say, Chris, but uh, all thanks to you, we have actually up the ante also, right? How, how he, they are using it. Harman, Harman was actually using it for her own game. Now she's a brand endorser. Come on, please. I will end this with a fun fact. And it's about your game, your data. We all know that left-handers are very flamboyant on the off. Now we have data to tell you that left-handers, when they play in the off, their swing speed is 23% higher than that of right-handers. Impact speed, 29% higher than that of right-handers. The last theories which we can discuss on why but that's a fact across the globe 
across good sample of Delhi players who have played this stadium. Right? We all know that left-handers are flamboyant, but we have some data to prove that the bat swing and impact swing is much more in the off than that of right-handers. With this uh, uh, move, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to hand it, hand it over to Greg and start the session. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, thanks, Gargan, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to uh, everyone that's there, or good morning. I'm sure there's a few uh, still in the morning time, but uh, very strange times indeed, and uh, I'm sure we're all finding quite uh, unique ways of passing the time. Um, Gargan asked me to, uh, to have a bit of a talk about my experiences in, uh, in, in coaching. And probably the first thing I've got to say is one of the few advantages that I've found of living this long is that I've seen a fair bit of stuff on the journey. And coaching hasn't always looked like this, you know, the way, uh, the way it is in this day and age. You know, my first exposure, obviously, to coaching was when I started playing cricket, when our father encouraged us to play and um, he instructed us. He didn't teach us in, uh, in, in any way. He instructed us um, about how he, he wanted us to play the game. And I think um, he, he was smart enough to realise that a father wasn't necessarily the best coach all the time. So he did have one of his friends give us some basic instruction in forward defence and back defence. Um, on a Sunday morning, we used to go around to his friend's home where he had a couple of practice wickets in the backyard and, and young hopeful cricketers from all around Adelaide really, but particularly down around our area, used to come on a Sunday morning and, and have some training at uh, Mr Fuller's Nets. But the, the part of it that I remember most of all is after each session with Mr Fuller, we would go into the other net and our father would throw balls to us, half volleys, long hops, full tosses, and teach us how to score runs. And I think the best message that he got through to me, and I'm assuming he got the same message through to my two brothers, was that we had a bat in our hand for one reason and one reason alone, and that was to score runs. And that really set me off on the, on the right path. I'm, I'm so grateful that that was the, the path that he headed us off on, because I think that was very important to how I finished up playing cricket. There, um, our exposure to the game was pretty limited in the sense of organised cricket. The bulk of our cricket in the early days was either in the backyard with my brothers or at various times with friends in the backyard or at a local park and we had some cricket at school and in the school holidays we got uh, got some games at, at the local club. There wasn't a lot of um, elite cricket. There weren't a lot of elite opportunities. There weren't many training sessions. So our greatest exposure uh, was with our siblings or our friends. And the best part of it, when I look back on, on these sessions, it was very much player-led because... We set up the rules, we picked the teams, we umpired the games, we had our own arguments, um, and there were plenty of those going backwards and forwards. There was no interference from adults. And so we, we developed our own style, our own game, and we were forced to develop the thinking processes um, either in those games with our siblings or our friends, or I can remember spending hours and hours uh, playing games on my own, throwing the ball against the wall and batting for, you know, it was always an Australian team, often playing against England, but I would bat for both teams. Obviously, I'd make more runs for the, the players I fancied than, than the other players. But that imagination was a very important part of, the development process and the things the things that have changed over the journey as far as I've, I've witnessed is that we had very little exposure to the nets it was matches albeit pick up games on a lot of occasions uh, for most of it and the nets were a top up and for the best part of my career 
you know, we, um, for domestic cricket, either club cricket or first class cricket, it was two net sessions a week. And you played the games on the, on the weekends. Now, in between times, you spent a lot of time thinking about the way you were playing and the results that you were getting. And I think the, the important part of that was that we were developing our mental skills at the same time that we were developing our, our physical skills. And again, when I look back on my own career and uh, watching other, other players and talking to some of the very best players from Sir Donald Bradman to the, the current day, there is no doubt that the best players are the best thinkers and the best decision makers. And I, what I see in cricket around the world is that we've taken away a lot of those opportunities for players to develop their mental skills. Now, the better ones will do it almost despite the system. But I think for a lot of players, what we've done is we've created an environment where they're always working on something. They're going into the nets and it's only about, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. And I think that inhibits development. And again, the best players are the best learners. You know, they, they make mistakes like everyone does, but they learn from their mistakes. They've generally built good relationships with a coach or coaches along, along the journey. And I have no doubt that most of them have mentors that they continue talking to. But the ones who make it are the ones who get out of the comfort zone. They continually test themselves. They're continually trying to get better. Um, they're, they're learning in various ways. Obviously, the um, uh, handheld devices and the internet and so on make information so much easier to find these days. But, um, you know, the better players are the ones who are continually trying to develop themselves as people as well as, as cricketers. And I think it's, a, it's something that coaches have to be very conscious of as well to make sure that they get out of their comfort zone. You know, I see a lot of coaches who, you know, th they know what they know and they stick to what they know. And I think that's a very dangerous thing as it was for a player. If you only work in the comfort zone, you're really not going to reach your full potential. And I believe that's very much the, 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 case, the case for coaches. You know, as I was playing the game, and bear in mind that we played in a very different era in the sense that we, we weren't professional cricketers. We were playing cricket as a pastime. We had a real job. And I think in, in many ways that took some of the pressure off because we weren't constantly thinking cricket 24-7. And I, again, I think this is an area that cricket needs to look at. I don't believe you need to be hooked into the game 24-7 to become good at it. In fact, I would venture to say it's the opposite. If, you don't, if players don't have other things going on in their life that they are developing and working on at the same time as their cricket, the likelihood is that they're not going to reach their potential because they become very narrow-minded. Um, the more open-minded they are and the more worldly they are, I think it is going to be better for their, for their cricket development. So it's important that cricket programs around the world take these things into consideration. You know, I never had any ambition to coach. You know, when I was playing cricket, I never thought about coaching. When I finished playing cricket, I just went back to work and uh, was in the business world for, for a number of years. It probably took the 1987 financial crash for me to um, even think seriously about doing, doing anything else because it very much like what's happening to us today, it was something that uh, caused all of us to stop and think about what we were doing and whether that was in fact the way we wanted to, to go. And whilst I enjoyed business, I realised I didn't enjoy it as much as I'd enjoyed cricket. So when an opportunity came to, to do some coaching, after being reluctant at first, I sat down and looked at the pros and cons of it. And I realised that it was something that I was probably going to be more passionate about than what I was doing elsewhere. And I'm so glad that I, that I got into, the, into coaching because it really has been a, an amazing journey. And, you know, I've continued to, to learn. I'm continuing, I hope, to learn today. 
And I think the day that you stop trying to learn is the day you not only don't get better, but you're probably going to start going backwards. So some of the things that I learned in those early experiences of coaching is that you've got all this intellectual property that you've developed over however many years you've been involved in the game. And the danger is that you want to download it as fast as you can thinking that, you know, I've got all this knowledge. I know how it works. If I can tell the players how it works, then they can go and do it. Well, I learned very quickly that they can't. And I learned very quickly that what I had to do was to get down to their level, not expect them to come up to my level. And I had to work out where each of the players were at before I could help them. And the other thing that I had to do and what I, what I learned that I had to do was that if I couldn't change the way they thought, I couldn't change the way they played. It was with the same thinking they were going to play the same way. So the real challenge was to get them to look at their own game differently, um, investigate their own game, uh, really do a good audit of it and just work out how they wanted to, wanted to be seen and how they wanted to play the game to get the best out of them. And interestingly enough, um, you know, the majority of players didn't want to change very much. They were very happy with what they had. And again, I learned that you can interfere too much. You, know, you see things when, when, particularly looking at batsmen in the nets, you look at them batting and you see things that they're doing and you can see things that maybe they're, they're not doing well or that they could do better. But the more often you intervene, um, I think the less likely it is that you're going to get the outcomes that you want. And I found over the, my experience is that asking questions is a lot better than giving answers. The more that I was able to help players find their own answers, the more likely it was that they were going to make changes to their game because it started them thinking differently. And with a different thought process, they were able to introduce different um, things in, into, their, into their game. Um, explore new frontiers I've talked about. I mean, tunnel vision, I've seen players with tunnel vision, but I've also seen coaches with tunnel vision, as I said before, about you know, knowing what they know, but not wanting to, to, to develop themselves more. Tunnel vision is almost worse than no vision at all, because you're only going to see the same things within the same confines, and you're not going to be able to help the players very much. I think the more the players involved in the decision-making of any any changes to their game, the better it, it's going to be. If it's just from the top down, only very few players are going to respond well to that sort of coaching. It really has to be a collaboration. Again, I see a lot of coaches who are trying to build the dependent relationships rather than building independent thinkers. And counterintuitively, if you can build, build an um, intuitive and uh, you know, good thinking player, they're more likely to come back to you with more questions than if you're building a dependent relationship. It's, it's a little bit like parenting. Um, you know, eventually, if it's all from the top down, the kids are going to want to get away from you as quickly as they can. And I think it's very much the same with, with players. So it's very much a collaborative relationship uh, where you're working towards, you know, a better outcome with the player rather than giving them too uh, much uh, direction. Hi, Greg. Can I come in with a question? You may, yes. Uh, so, this thing, uh, you, you mentioned this thinking is very important more than the physical aspect of the game. And you yep. mentioned that uh, the players... Sorry, who, who's talking? I can't... Uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. But who, who's it talking? Hi, this is Roy from Bombay. Hi, hi Roy. Roy, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, you 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 alluded on the fact that players used to have the uh, used to used to be able to think independently much more earlier yeah. than they can now. Uh, what is the the change or the reason for that you you find in your in your experience? Look, I, I have no doubt that there is more coaching available, and uh, players have tended to go to coaches looking for answers. Um, there weren't coaches around in, in the early days. And you see it in India as well. I mean, MS Dhoni is a perfect example of someone who grew up 
working out for himself how to play the game. And, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that if MS Dhoni had been coached from an early age, he would have been a very different player from, from the one that we, that we saw. Um, so there are parts of India where coaching isn't as readily available. And a lot of those kids are the ones who are coming up and, and they're the ones that have got the creative thinking and the ones that um, look at the game a little bit differently from those who have been taught early. You know, we didn't grow up with, um, with throwdowns. We didn't grow up with uh, side arms. We didn't grow up with bowling machines. So we were pretty limited on, you know, the, the sort of exposure that we could get to batting because we relied very much on someone to bowl to us, um, which meant that we had less sessions. They were shorter sessions, but they were much more intense. You know, I see a lot of sessions in the game now that are long with low intensity. And players don't get better playing the game at low intensity. You know, we're never going to get away from the net. So it's a, it's a big part of the game. And, and it is a convenient way to train. But I think we, we need to be a little bit more creative with how we use the nets. You know, there are times when a player needs to be working on something. And I think you, you have those remedial nets where they are working on whatever they're working on. But the majority of the nets have got to be about learning to bat, learning to make runs, creating an environment where the player is, is thinking as they would in a game situation and reacting to what's happening rather than being in their own little cocoon at their end, almost working separately from the bowler or the, the coach who's throwing or a bowling machine that he's receiving balls from. You know, the more that we can create the environment where the player has to think about scoring runs. You know, the best players we know are the best players or, you know, the best ones at being able to score runs, find ways to score runs. You know, you look at some players playing in a four or a five day game are very different from a player, that same player playing in a 50 over game or particularly in a 20 over game. 20 over cricket has been good, I think, for, for cricket coaching because it's shown us that, you know, you can, um, you know, you can change environments up and you can see change in, in players. But I think the, the, the more times that a batsman can go to the nets and be thinking about scoring runs, the more likely it is that they're going to develop their, their scoring abilities. And, and often, you know, we as coaches are part of the problem because we are the ones who are giving them things to work on. And so every time they go to the nets, they're working on something and we're conscious of them working on something. So I, I think it's really important that um, you separate training sessions from remedial sessions to playing sessions. And again, you know, it can be a one-on-one, -on -one, a one bowler or two or three bowlers with one batsman. But I think making them conscious of the fact of their mental routines. To me, the mind is the new frontier for cricket. The two sports that I see that are overcoached are cricket and golf. And they're, they're both, they're not dissimilar in the sense that you've got a lot of time to think between plays. And what you think about between balls, what you think about between overs, what you think about while you're waiting to go into bat, what you think about in the week or the days leading up to the game can make or break you. And we know the best players are the best players mentally. And we do nothing in our training sessions to encourage that development, particularly for young players. It's constantly about working on technique. And technique isn't what we think it is. And technique is driven by the thought processes. And I know from a personal point of view, my cricket started to improve, really started to improve once I realised that working on my mental game was more important than working on my physical game. Once I realised that my routines were more important than hitting, hitting the ball for the sake of hitting the ball, I started to get better and I judged my training sessions in a different way. All of a sudden, Instead of how well did I hit the ball, it was more how well did I react to what was bowled to me? Did I react in an appropriate way? 
If I reacted in an appropriate way, then I judge the session as a success. And not coincidentally, the better I reacted to each delivery was bold, the better I actually hit the ball. Because what happens if you're in there working on something, whatever that may be, you finish up, your mind is down your end and you actually don't see the ball leave the bowler's hand. The important thing for a batsman to, to do is to see the ball leave the bowler's hand. You know, we talk about watching the ball, but do, do batsmen really understand what watching the ball is? Looking in the general direction isn't watching the ball. You know, the, the screen of vision for a batsman at release point should not be a screen the size of a sight screen. It's got to be the screen the size of a bowler's hand. And that's what you, that's what you have to be picking up as it leaves the bowler's hand because that's where most of the information is. And we drive players away from learning that because we're constantly talking to them about something that they've got to work on at their end. And when they're thinking on that, they're not seeing the ball leave the bowler's hand. All of a sudden, it, it comes out of the big screen, out of the sight screen, but it's probably halfway down by that stage and they've missed most of the information. So somehow we have to find a way to make training sessions more mindful so that players learn those things. You know, what, as I said before, technique isn't what we, what we think it is. It's not just the physical technique. The physical is an expression of what's going on in the mind. And that's why it's important that we have to make sure that training sessions are mindful. You know, apart from being good players, you know, what do Virat Kohli, Steve Smith, A.B. de Villiers and Kane, Kane Williamson have in common? Does anyone want to have a crack at it? I'll give you the first one. They all average over 50. But there's one other thing that they all have in common that is critical to their success. Pick the length early. It's, it's even before that. I think, yes, they do. Absolutely. And that is a critical part of it. But it's what they, what they do, their initial movements are critical to what they can do afterwards and what, you know, their success. So I'll tell you, they don't commit any weight to the front foot before they've picked up line and length. The big difference between the players who average over 50, and I can go back to, not that I saw him play, but having looked at the video, the, the footage that was available from the time and having spoken to him about it, from Bradman to all these guys of the current day, every one of them who has averaged over 50 doesn't make any commitment to wait on the front foot until they've picked up line and length. That allows them to pick up more information. So they've got longer to pick up information before they make a move. And it means that they can move to a position that allows them to be able to react better to that ball, whether it's in a defensive way or whether it's in, a, in an attacking way. The interesting thing, the one person that I've found since Bradman through to the current day that didn't do that was Steve Waugh. For the first half of his career, he committed to the front foot before he picked up line and length. He was obviously looking for short balls. And in that period of his career, he averaged in the 30s. And I've spoken to him about it, and he doesn't know why he changed. I, I, picked, I noticed that after a tour to India, and probably that, that, that very successful tour to India that the Australian team had at that time. That was when he made the change. And I thought maybe he'd picked up something from Sachin or, you know, whatever. He doesn't understand why he made the change. But from the day he made the change, he averaged 70 in test cricket and finished up with an average of 50 odd in, in test cricket. It is the most important thing I've found in batting and looking and you know, studying the best players that have played the game, that's the only thing they have in common. They all have a different way to get there. You know, Steve Smith is the prime example of someone who does it very differently from anyone else. But he still finishes up in a very similar position at the point of release to everybody else. It's easy to get distracted by all of the, the movements and the things that he does. But in fact, the thing that he has in common with all of the good players from Bradman onwards 
is that he doesn't commit any weight to that front foot. Once you've made a commitment of weight to the front foot before you've picked up line and length, you've lost 80% of your options once the ball is bowled. And Greg? Yes. Troy, Troy here. Yes. Do, do you mind Hello, if I, Yeah. How are you? I'm very good, mate. Thank you I was very much. Just, uh, I was just trying to draw some, um, draw some lines to um, all the great stuff that you've been talking about. You know, obviously going back to that, that early inception of having a really creative mind and, and linking all that, uh, all that good work you do in the backyard and in games to, to, to your decision making. And uh, I was just, you know, I've listened to you a lot, as you know, and uh, take a lot of words and a lot of wisdom. Um, just trying to work out um, if that is so important, um, the, 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 the movement uh, or when you move, how can, how can we make sure that this is linked into those early creative days when they're uh, trying to make all those, uh, all those decisions and all those choices? How, how as a coach can we ensure that um, if we do and we are good coaches and we don't step in too early and, and we make sure we create a really good environment for these young players to come through, how, how would you coach that? How do you coach that particular very important um, um, part of, the, of batting that you talk about in regards to the movement and not committing too early and making sure that you make the right decisions to, to know when to do that? And um, I suppose, you know, drawing back to how can straight bat help us? Um, is it something that straight bat can measure? Uh, if this is so critical, and I know, you know, um, Bucky's done a lot of work, uh, Chris Rogers, sorry, has done a lot of work on how the bat moves up and down and we can track all that. Is there any way we can, we can measure this? Or is it something that, you know, we just have to hope eventuates? And that was a long question. So... Hopefully, I've got no, to the no. Point that again. was about that was a long three or four questions, but that's okay. You're allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> no, look, look. That, that's the. I think that's the million dollar question. It really is an important question because, you know, Gary Sobers said it in his book some some years ago. Why don't we teach what the good players do? Why do we teach what the ordinary players do? And it's a bloody good question because. Um, you know, the, the good players make runs against all types of bowling in all types of conditions all around the world. So they're obviously doing things right. You know, we need, we need to do more of an investigation on what they do to be able to um, bring that in as early as possible. You know, the only experience I've had is, you know, with, with young cricketers is the best way to get them doing that is not to give them too much instruction too early. Once you tell, you know, if I teach someone how to play a cover drive like I played the cover drive, that's just put a lid straight away on their cover drive because I've already given them a, a blueprint. And so it's unlikely that they're going to come, go away and come up with something better. So the, the thing that Bradman talked about it in his coaching book, you know, my father talked about it when we were kids, you know, I would rather tell you what I want you to do than how to do it. So the, this coaching with the young players that I've done is about telling them where you want to hit the ball than how to hit the ball. So, you know, if I want them to hit the ball through the offside, we'll all get into pretty similar positions because from a human movement point of view, that's the way it works. If I want to shift my body to hit the ball through the offside, We'll all do it in a fairly similar way, but each will have their own nuance. Again, if, if MS Dhoni was taught to bat early, he would never have been as dangerous a player as he was because the one thing about MS Dhoni that I noted when I first saw him play was that he hit balls to different parts of the ground. You know, he hit balls where other players didn't hit them. You know, whereas somebody might have hit it through the covers, he's just as likely to have hit it over the wicket. You know, it's allowing them the opportunity to explore their own movement patterns and get them to hitting, getting, get them to hit at targets rather than tell them how to do it. Because again, once I tell someone how to play a cover drive, they're so busy thinking about what I've told them that they don't watch the ball and the body doesn't move like it should. I mean, we are a computer system. 
the body is the hard drive and the, the, the mind is the, you know, is what drives the program, is the uh, software. And if I'm telling someone how to do something, they're going to be thinking about that. What they finish up doing is trying to think their way through the shot. They're starting to try and bat with the hard drive running the program and it becomes clunky. So the, the best way that I've found is to get kids to be hitting balls at targets and they will work out the best movement pattern for them to do it. And interestingly enough, when they're thinking about what they want the end result to be, they're not thinking about what their pre-movements are, their initial movements are, and they actually, they move very efficiently. Once you start instructing them how to move, their movements become less efficient. So it's really important to allow the right part of the, the computer to, to run the program. And it's the software that should be running the, the program. You know, I, I think we need to set up environments. You know, the, most other sports in the world have learned long ago that small sided games work better than instruction sessions. And getting kids playing different sorts of games with the right people observing, I think is, is the best way to in, instruct or introduce young players to the game. You know, the, just getting back to, I mean, going back to um, some of the better players, there, there is an, an unholy alliance in batting that you must avoid. And it's probably the, the unholy trinity in the sense, the first part of it is, don't commit any, any significant weight to the front foot before you've picked up line and length. That's critical. Um, bottom hand dominance, you can get away with bom bottom hand dominance as long as you don't make that commitment to the front foot. You know, Steve Smith's a perfect example. He's got a very dominant bottom hand. It's really under the, under the grip. It's quite a, an amazing grip. But it works because he doesn't then commit the the sin of committing weight to the front foot before he picks up line and length. So he can still adjust his body position to be able to allow for the grip that he's, he's grown up with. So, you know, you can make anything work. Good players do make all sorts of different things work, but it's based on the fact that pretty much you don't make the, com the commitment of weight to the front foot before you've picked up line and length then you can make almost anything work. Is it the most efficient? Maybe not. It may well be the most efficient way to do it. Steve certainly seems to be making it that. But everybody you know, has their own grip and their own, their own setup. But generally speaking, the better players have got to that same position at the, at the point of release uh, through the history of the game. The other things that are critical for good batting is getting into rhythm, what the good players do, they get into the rhythm of the bowler. They pick up the bowler's rhythm really quickly. And again, that's something that we don't talk about. I've never heard anyone, any coach talk about it. But it's such a critical thing. As a batsman, I want to get into rhythm with each bowler because they've all got their own rhythm. So, you know, when players ask me, you know, what should my pre-movement be? I don't know. It depends who's bowling your pre-movement will finish up being fairly similar because that's the way you are with each bowler, but the timing of it, I can remember watching Ricky Ponting bat and the number of times, and, and Sachin Tendulkar was another one, it was fascinating to watch him bat against uh, Murulithran because with Murulithran's different action and a different flight pattern, you could see Sachin adjusting his, his timing of his movements to get into the rhythm of the different flight from, from Muralithran. I used to see it with Ponting a lot. You, know, you could see that front foot just sort of tapping on the ground before he made a commitment just to slow himself down, whether he's picked up a slower ball or whether it was against a spin bowler and he just had to take a, a different timing to, to fit in with the, the pace of that particular de delivery. So if you want to get timing in your shots, you need to be in time with the bowler with your movements because you need to get to the point of contact in a timely fashion. So at the right time, if you get there early, the timing will be off. If you get there late, you may not have any timing at all. 
and you may not get another chance to to try it out in that in that innings and the other thing is angles really important to understand each bowler and their angles you know each bowler has a different angle you know if you had a right arm over the wicket bowler who's bowling out swingers there are different angles involved in that to a right arm over the wicket bowler who's bowling in swingers so if you don't understand those angles you won't understand where your scoring opportunities will come from and again the better players understand that they know before the bowlers bowled which you know which deliveries he you know are uh, his suite of deliveries and he knows that if the outswing bowlers pitch you know trying to pitch it about or start it about middle stump and swing it away and it doesn't swing he knows that the leg side is where his scoring opportunities are coming from if it swings his scoring opportunities are more likely to be on the on the offside they're critical things you know left arm over the wicket right arm over the wicket right right arm right arm going to be different for every bowler and again we don't help players to understand that in their development so that as they mature and as they go through the grades they've got a chance to be able to adapt to that better quality bowling because one thing you know is that once you get to the highest levels of the game you're not getting many bad balls so if you can't score off the less than good balls you're not going to make runs and if you're not looking to score off the less than good balls you're not going to make runs the better players own that danger zone you know the danger zone that i'm talking about it's a piece of turf that's probably about as you know big as the, the front door mat and if the bowler owns that then he's winning the battle if the batsman can take control of that danger zone then he can dictate what the bowler bowls and i love watching good players and how they take control of that danger zone you know if a bowler strays to the the far end closest to the batsman of that danger zone he'll hit it back past him once a good player does that very few bowlers are going to come back the next ball and pitch it up they will try and make an adjustment and generally they'll over adjust and it'll be a short ball and that's again why good player you know the good players seem to get more scoring opportunities than than others because they make scoring opportunities by taking control of that danger zone you know cricket in its simple terms is a battle over that piece of turf that's the size of your front door mat and if the batsman can make that danger zone the size of your handheld device he's going to win the battle and again we don't talk about that you know we talk about left elbow up or top hand or bottom hand or get your foot close to the ball whatever but they're less important than these other things that the the good players get good at um so it's really important you know that we um bring those sorts of opportunities to to young players and going back to Troy's question you know what can straight bat do for us and you know why straight bat um you know when i saw the straight bat technology first of all i got excited i got to say i thought this is this is an answer it might not be the answer but this is an answer this is a starting point this takes me back to gps it takes me back to trackman you know when they first came in nobody was that interested Uh, what do we what do we need all this for well i think troy you can tell us how important trackman's been in um, you know from a bowling coaching point of view you know gps nobody wanted gps when it first came out but they stuck with it and brought it in and now everybody uses gps not only in cricket but it's in in every sport it to me straight bat is a conversation starter we've all as coaches been in situations where we've had conversations with batsmen and we've talked to them about this thing and this part of their batting or that part of the batting and we've been met by a stone wall either just blank eyes or just out and out stone wall they don't want to change they don't believe you even when you sit them down with the video tape they will argue black and blue that that's not what happened 
you can't argue against the data that straight bat is throwing up. And for me, this is a, this is a conversation starter. You can go to a batsman and say, look, you know, would you like to have a look at this information? And, you know, you can tell them that, you know, your bat's coming down from gully, it's online momentarily, then it pushes back to the offside. And so it's probably only online for this much of the downswing. They will argue black and blue that that's not right. And you can show it to them on videotape and they'll still argue the case. But you show them the data from straight bat and they can't argue with that. And I think this is going to start the conversations that we as coaches need to do. And Troy, I think, yes, it can show, you, you will see when, you know, a batsman will see when they get the best bat speed, contact speed, the best contact, most consistent contact. So you'll be able to get a baseline for every player. This is what they do. I mean, some of them, their baseline might be pretty bad to start with and there, there might be some work that needs to be done on improving their baseline. But for the better players, you know, you can show them that when they're batting in the nets, this is what happens. But when they bat in the middle, this happens. Now, why does that happen? Because your thought processes have changed. In the nets, you're relaxed and everything's flowing quite nicely. You get into a game and all of a sudden you become a bit constricted, a little bit tense. And all of a sudden the bat swing changes. I know because I, I find that every time I play golf, my swing changes every day, depending on how I'm thinking. And I know the same was the, the case when I was playing cricket. The good days were better thought days than the bad days. And I think that finally we have got some technology here that's going to be able to give us something that can start a conversation, but it's also going to give us something that's a really good tool to be able to help batsmen to get more of their good stuff more often. And once they start to understand what they do, they'll feel it when it happens and then they'll be able yeah. to go and confirm it when, when they look at the data. Um, that's pretty much all I've got to say, Gagan. I think this might be the time if, if guys have got some questions that we can uh, have a bit of a conversation. Thank you, Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, you know, it's like... Uh... Uh, listening to you and I've listened to you a few times. It's just unbelievable. I think I'm a bit privileged that I have. Uh, guys, uh, this is an open session now. Please uh, unmute yourself. Any questions to Greg or to anybody else, please go ahead. You need to unmute yourself if you're talking. Rx, you have to unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, Greg, Rx here, Murli here from Bangalore. Hi, Murli. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Greg, I have a question. This is for junior cricketers. Now, yeah. uh, what we are, you've been talking about is empowering the junior cricketers, allow them to go and play, give them directions. Uh, now, how important is grip, stance and back lift uh, for them to be taught at that level? Look, I think... Some basic instruction is important to get them as comfortable as possible and as natural as possible. You know, cricket is an athletic activity, you know, and so therefore the more athletic you can be, the more efficient you will be, the better outcomes that you will be. You know, if it's, if it's pretty close to what we would consider to be sort of a you know, natural stance and grip, yeah, you know, and they're they're doing well. I wouldn't I wouldn't go interfering too much. But if someone's got something that's dramatically different from the normal, maybe it's worth some some intervention. But what I find with young players is that you know if you give them a bat and a ball, um, and they're just playing, they generally adopt pretty athletic positions. It, it comes as a, as a reasonably you know, natural thing to them. Um, you will occasionally get somebody who's quite you know, dramatically different from that. And if they've got hands that are working against each other, you know, I might be inclined to make some suggestions 
to them. But I mean, Alan Border got through his career with a grip where he had the hands this far apart. You know, so again, you can make anything work as long as those other key points are, are adhered to. So I wouldn't make a big thing of it because again, you know, I think technique is very different from what we understand technique to be. You know, what, what I want to see with young players is their ability to move. If they can move, footwork is no more than changing from one position to a more optimal position to suit the delivery that's been bowled and the shot that you've envisaged. So, I mean, if you stay in the one place and try and play a cover drive, one ball and a you know, a pull shot, next ball, and you haven't moved your feet, you're probably not going to be very efficient. So their ability to be able to read length and then be able to shift position to be able to um, you know, react appropriately to that delivery, then what they're doing is probably okay. You know, I, I think we can get caught up in how good they look, as we see with Steve Smith. You know, it's not about how good he looks. How efficient is he and how many runs does he make? So I think you've got to be a little bit careful, you know, when, when interfering too much. Thank you. Greg, it's, Greg, it's John. Um, yes, John. Yeah, I, I'm just coming back. I, you consistently use this word interfere, and, and I, I've been thinking about this for a long time now. And you, you've talked about it in relation to the batsman and the relationship with thought processes in coaching batsmen. And I've often thought about it. We, when we look at fast bowlers, and I know it's maybe a little bit away from what you were talking about, but again, are we nurturing our fast bowlers or are we interfering too much with them? And I think it's a very similar thing where Sometimes we interfere way too much with our, with our young fast bowlers. I'm talking more from a physical perspective rather than just letting them be and letting them grow into themselves. Um, and, I've, and, often, and often thought, particularly in the India context, where we, where we feel like we need to be involved in every single part of the process through their development, particularly their physical development. And I'm pretty certain that's why most of these young kids come unstuck. And... You know, I think if I had my time again, the way we look at approaching some of these young fast bowlers, particularly from a physical perspective, would we do it very differently? And I think we would. And I think if you're looking consistently at the end result now for a lot of our young fast bowlers, both here and even in Australia, they're not great from a physical perspective. And I think if there's an area that we need to start changing and taking some of the concepts that you've now brought up around batting and coaching batsmen, I think the same thought processes now have to be taken to our young fast bowlers, particularly in the world of S and C and particularly in the world of their physical development. Because I think we are interfering too much. We're trying to do too much with them rather than nurturing them along a natural um, individual sort of pathway. So yeah, that's just probably more of a thought rather than anything about using your knowledge in the batting world and coaching and perhaps learning from that and using it in other aspects and various disciplines within the game. Yeah, look, um, Troy and I have had this conversation uh, quite a few times over the, over the years and Troy can certainly add something to it, I'm sure. You know, if, if someone was running up you know, with their front arm in the air already sort of loaded up before they got there, I think you should probably be looking at trying to help them. You know, we do, we do step in from a bowling coaching point of view when someone's that sort of different from, from the model, but we don't do it from a cricketing point of view, you know, batting point of view very much, um, you know, in relation to those key points of the, the better players. But, you know, you look at a um, Malinga, you know, prime example of someone who developed a very different way to bowl and had a lot of success doing it because he was so different. You know, the, the different uh, release point, different angles. You know, why do we pick different bowl, you know, different types of bowlers in a team? I, I can remember at one stage when I was with the Indian team, um, we had a tour, and I won't talk about the particular tour, but, you know, the, the selectors gave us three left-arm fast bowlers who were the same height, bowling at the same pace. Now, we effectively had one bowler because there was no difference in angles. When, when one guy came off, the next bloke replaced him was the same bowler as far as angles and height and pace and all of those things went. 
you know, the reason you pick teams with different types of bowlers is because, you know, why do wickets fall often after the change of a bowler? Because the angles change and the batsman hasn't adjusted to it. So when you've got someone like a Malinga, you know, Jeff Thompson was, was, uh, was very different. Boomer is very different. Um, you know, I agree with you. I, I think we need to let players develop um, as naturally as possible unless they're going to hurt themselves. You know, I think that's the time, you know, I, I, I know, you know, Troy and I have been observing games together a lot in recent years and you notice straight away if someone's got an inefficient run-up, for instance, I think you can help them. You know, they're, they're the sorts of things that I, I think you can, uh, you can be helpful and it's not necessarily interfering. But we don't need to be trying to make everyone look like the same bowler because if you get the same bowlers, you're not going to you're not going to bowl sides out. So I think that you can you can interfere too much, but I think there's also enough research being done and there's enough data that's been collected to know why players why fast bowlers hurt themselves, and you know to use that wisely I think is very important. But you know to turn a Malinga into a you know upright a side on bowler might have absolutely destroyed him. He may never have played first class cricket, let alone uh, international cricket. That was his, you know, that was his, um, uh, you know, reason for, for success. And, uh, you know, I've seen a few of them through the years. Mike Proctor from South Africa bowled off the wrong foot. You know, if we'd, someone had tried to make him bowl off the correct foot, he may never have been the, been the same cricketer. So, you know, I know what you're saying, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with a lot of it, but I also, having been around the likes of Troy for so long, I also understand that there are points where you do have to step in. You have anything to add to that, Troy? Oh, thanks, GC. No, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, definitely some efficiencies that you can sort of look at. I mean, obviously, you would uh, definitely be looking at the naturalness of somebody um, and how they develop is, is definitely important. Um, it goes for, for, I suppose, anything you do. Um, we do know there's some efficiencies in uh, running that, you know, could help, um, but we're not sort of changing too much. I mean, I know Boomer walk, you know, runs in with his run up and, and away he goes and he's very, he's, he's effective. And I suppose that's what you need to understand as a coach, the difference between effective and efficiency. And then um, obviously what sort of uh, relationship or what sort of coaching style and, and what's your, you know, what is your philosophy on coaching would be uh, what I'd be looking at in, in why you would want to change somebody that's um, that maybe already, like you say, um, bowler's job is to take wickets. So if they're taking wickets and they're adapting to each of the levels as they go through, um, maybe that's the best way of doing it. Um, I just know, and I know, Johnny, you talk about, um, you know, the biggest thing that breaks fast bowlers down young is, is obviously the stress injuries, which is basically the body saying you've, you've overtrained it. Um, so trying to get exactly. those, trying to get those right levels yeah. of um, adaptability and periodization is, is, is important, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the biggest thing in a stress injury is, is an over, that's what they call the stress injuries, trying to push them hard enough so they improve and adapt, but not too much that they probably spend six months out doing yeah. nothing or 12 months out. Gotcha. Agree. Thanks, Troy. So uh, I have a question to Greg and perhaps anybody who would like to, uh, to talk about it. Is, uh, interestingly, you mentioned that uh, technique is uh, Greg. You mentioned that technique is a is a physical expression of uh, a, a mentality, a, a kind of thinking. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, straight bat offers us uh, a baseline for for the way a person is expressing his uh, technique. So, yep. how can straight bat or any other or any coach, for example, for that matter, uh, develop the kind of thinking? that is then expressed physically in the technique. I think the, the important thing is, as I mentioned in the early stages, that you know, the most important thing that our father taught, taught us was that you know, you've got a bat in your hand for one reason, one reason alone, and that's the score runs. 
I think if we can encourage players from an early age that that's what batting is about. It's not about not getting out. Now, obviously, if you want to make runs, you don't want to get out. But if your sole focus is, is, is on not getting out, you won't move. You won't get into positions to be able to, to score runs and to be able to score off those less than good balls and to dominate the, the, the danger zone. You know, I think if, if the... And when I talk about looking to score runs, I'm not talking about slogging. I'm looking at, you know, I'm talking about, you know, looking at decent scoring opportunities to get the scoreboard ticking. You know, that I always felt my job as a batsman was to get the pressure down the other end as fast as I could. If the pressure was down my end, I was in trouble. But if I could put the pressure on, on the bloke at the other end, the bowler, then he was the one that was going to be most likely to make mistakes and he was going to bowl less good balls and give me more scoring opportunities. And funnily enough, when you're looking to score runs, you are generally in a better position to be able to defend anyway. You, you're able to decide. You know, the biggest difference for me with Steve Smith from when he first started in Test cricket to where he's got to, is he's worked out which balls he can attack and which balls he can't. When he first started, like all of us, he probably over-attacked. He attacked balls that weren't there to be attacked and made mistakes. And we all learn that you can't keep doing that, otherwise you won't survive. So he all of a sudden worked out which balls he could attack and which ones he had to let go or defend. And he's become the player that he is today. So I think the more we can encourage them to look for the scoring opportunities, the sooner they will learn which ones they can attack and which ones they have to defend. If you start from the mindset of defending first and then I'll attack the ones that I can, you won't have many balls that you can attack. And I see too many young players who are being brought up to be those types of batsmen where I won't get out and then I'll make some runs. And, you know, occasionally they do make runs. But unfortunately, what you become, and I mean, I experienced it as a player on the days where I was more in, you know, intent on not getting out, I couldn't score runs because when they bowled me a bad ball, I wasn't ready for it. You know, the first point of release from a bowler's hand is a full ball. So I, you know, I think you know, those early movements that I talked about with the good players are a result of, in the best part, they're looking for that full ball and then they react to what comes. At least if they're ready for the full ball, they're ready for the first, first point of release. The subconscious will pick up that at some point, if the ball's still in the hand, it's not going to be a full ball. So they're all ready. Then they plant the front foot to push back. And again, that's the timely fashion of the, you know, getting into position in a timely manner to be able to play the appropriate shot. So I think you know, what, we, what we need to do from a coaching point of view, and this is not talking about reckless batting by any stretch of the imagination. You know, again, what the better players are better at is working out what the parameters are for today in these conditions against this bowler and in this situation of the game. Now, there are times in a game where, you know, you have to defend your backside off because that's what the conditions and that's what the situation demands. But even in that, that situation, if you're not looking for the scoring opportunities, A, you won't score any runs and B, you'll probably get out because you won't get into a good position to be able to defend the good ones anyway. So batting, as in life, is an exercise in risk management. And the sooner we can introduce young batsmen to the fact that that's what it is, this is a, an exercise in risk management. If I want to score runs, I have to take some risks. What are acceptable risks in these conditions? And the sooner they understand that, the sooner they're likely to be useful to their team. If they go through their career in the comfort zone of thinking that batting is only about not getting out, they'll be no bloody use to them and to themselves and they'll be no use to the team. So life is an exercise in risk management. Batting is definitely an exercise in risk management because if I want to make runs, I've got to play some shots. 
So the sooner I learn which balls I can attack and which ones I have to defend, the sooner I'm likely to be a useful member of any cricket team. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think for the lack of time, probably one last question, if there's any, and then uh, wrap it up. Uh, Greg Murli here. Yes, Murli. Yeah. Uh, what would your advice be uh, for young coaches who are handling the junior teams, junior players? What, what, what would your uh, three points that you you would uh, tell a coach to look look for? Well, I'll probably go back a step further, Murli, in, in that you know the the first thing I would be telling coaches with young players is don't give them too many instructions. Tell them what you want them to do, not how to do it. Let them work out what is best for them. Because you may, and I see it all the time, young players surprise you because they do things that you didn't think they were capable of. But only if you don't clog their mind up too much with too many instructions. Yeah, so... Um, you know, if it's, if it's a youngster who's learning the game, all I'm doing from a batting point of view is I'll give them three scoring zones. One either side of the wicket, square of the wicket, and one straight down the ground. Now, initially, you've got to help them by bowling or throwing the ball in the direction to be able to play the ball square of the wicket on the offside or square of the wicket on the leg side or to hit it back past you. But guess what? After a while, they've worked out they can play a cut shot, a pull shot and drive. With those three shots, you can play cricket because every other shot is a derivation of those three, three shots. And I've, I've had a lot of success with, with young kids with just doing that. And within two or three sessions, you then, then, so what happens is they get good at playing a cut shot, a pull shot and a drive with the help of you delivering the ball at an appropriate pace, length and line, and they learn to deal with it. Then you go to the next stage and say, okay, now you decide which scoring zones you're going to, you know, where you're going to hit the ball. You just decide with each one where you want to hit it. And it might be that they hit a, you know, a half tracker straight back past you, which is what MS Dhoni would have done. You know, so they soon work out how to shift their body and you know, make the choice themselves of where they want to hit the ball. Now, I've seen kids learn cut shots, cover drives, square, uh, sorry, um, pull shots, and even hook shots in two or three sessions, and I've never told them once how to do it. And it's quite innovating as a, as a coach. You know, the, the feedback that you get is unbelievable because they you can see them enjoying themselves because they're having success and the feedback that you you get is that they're learning something and the less you've told them the better and the more likely it is they'll learn something that will be valuable valuable to them because as i said earlier if you tell them how to play a cover drive that's it you've put a lid on their cover drive they won't come up with a different variation whereas if you give them targets to hit, they might find a better way for them to play the cover drive than you could have taught them. Then once, you know, once they're out there and playing in games, what I'm looking for is I'm looking at how well they're reading length. I want to see if they go forward to the ones they should go forward to and go back to the ones they should go back to. Or if they're going forward to the ones they, that I thought they should have gone back to and they can hit it somewhere and score runs off it, I'm not going to be too bothered about it. So I think it's their ability to read length. And again, with those simple little drills of, you know, with a young player, getting them started with scoring zone square that we get either side, scoring zone straight and let them work it out. You'll be amazed at how quickly they develop. And the feedback that you'll, you'll be getting is that they're enjoying themselves. The other thing when you're in a full sort of full training session with a, you know, a full squad of boys, if there's not a lot of noise going on and there's not a lot of laughing and, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, a little bit of banter going between players, then it's probably not a very good session. 
if I come to a session and there's no noise, there's no laughter and there's no one's having any fun, you can generally guarantee that no one's learning anything. And if you as a coach are not finding it fun, then they're probably not enjoying themselves and they're not learning something. So I think we've got to change the environments in, in the training. We've got to change our attitude. You know, cricket's a game. The reason that we all played cricket was because it was fun and we liked it. And we've taken a lot of the fun out of the game because we, there's so many instructions. There's so much finger waving and don't do it like this, do it like that. What the kids hear is that I'm no good. You know, if you say to someone, no, no, not like that, do it like this, all they hear is I'm no good, I can't do it. We got to take that sort of pressure off young cricketers and get them as quickly as possible enjoying themselves. Now, not everybody's going to be an international cricketer. Our job as coaches are, is to identify the ones that have got some ability and then move them on as quickly as possible. The worst thing, worst thing we can do to a talented cricketer is to keep them at a level at which they're competent for too long. As soon as you recognise that they are capable of this le level, get them to the next level as quickly as you can because they need to be stretched. They need to have more challenges. Guess what happens in you know, computer games? The levels go up pretty quickly and the kids move through the levels pretty quickly and they want to move through the levels pretty quickly. And what we do in cricket is we hold them down at a level all the time and we stop them getting that extra challenge and they adapt when, when they move through you know you see the kids on these computer games they move through the levels very quickly because they pick it up and they learn and they move on we don't let them do that in cricket and we've got to do more of it so yeah. make it as much fun as you can thank you Yes, I really wish this conversation can carry on. I'm sure all of us do, but uh, yeah, I mean, I know we have we have a bit more time than normal, but uh, I think uh, spent around <laughs> 20 minutes. Uh, it you know, might I, be lunch time at your place, mate, but it's dinner time here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, pleasure, serious pleasure. I think this was fascinating personally for me, and so I'm thankful to all of you to join. I have one request for all of you. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is just a very very modest attempt, right? Of getting folks like you come together on a platform. Two things which I need. Uh, one, uh, do you think such a such a framework of getting somebody talking and then we have interactive sessions? If you have any other idea how to make it happen, we'll be more than willing to take. Any topics you want to discuss? Please share. I truly believe uh, what's happening around the globe is unprecedented, not only in terms of what's happening. Uh, from a health perspective, but from behavior perspective. They say it takes 21 days to develop a habit. Guess what? We'll be more than, in India, more than 21 days in lockdown. Behavior <laughs> will change. And that's a given. In that way, what means for sports, what we thought was not possible, may be possible. So these are things, if, you know, things like these we want to discuss. Anything, please share with us. We'll try and create this platform. Last is that uh, we plan to do this regularly, weekly. If there's any other suggestion to that, please let us know. It's a platform for all of us, right? Uh, please feel free to ping anyone from Straightback and we'll be very, very happy to take your feedback, learn from it and adapt. On that note, uh, is, there any, is there any comment, any feedback right now? Else? No, I just think, uh, Greg, thank you very much. It was really nice to know your perspective towards uh, batting and overall. But I think during the course, uh, during the course, we'll surely interact a bit more also and, if, you know, discuss a few things more. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gagan. Thanks, Sai. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, pleasure. Greg. Real thank pleasure. You. Thanks, Gagan. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.